Greetings and salutations. It's Dave Duford here at Duford Insurance Group, where I help agents like you become top producing insurance professionals. And today I have my uh, friend in the business, Mr. Jordan, to tell us what it's like being a newer agent selling final expense face to face. Jordan, say hello today. Hey, how's it going? Thank you so much for being here, Jordan. So yeah, if you can kind of give us a little bit of uh, background on yourself and uh, how you kind of stumbled into this business we call Final Expense. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know, just like everybody else, I, I did start out wanting to do sales. I, uh, I went to college and got a degree in finance and uh, ended up doing some accounting with that. And then I actually worked for the government for five years doing air traffic. And uh, my wife got kind of burnt out. We decided to move back closer to family and uh, decided to get into sales because I did not want to, after doing air traffic, I did not want to go back to accounting or some sort of boring desk job. So I thought sales would be a good solution. And uh, turned out to be pretty good at it, uh, working for State Farm, and uh, got a little burnout whenever COVID hit, doing the telesales uh, with State Farm, and decided to, uh, you know, had planned for a while, you know, watching your videos and some other guys on YouTube, I had planned for a while to jump into final expense. And uh, once COVID hit and telesales slowed down my State Farm sales, I just jumped in and committed. And uh, it's been um, it's been pretty good. I mean, it's been a little bit uh, ups and downs, but it's been good overall. So that's interesting. I, I forgot that you had started at kind of the, I guess, the traditional or typical insurance route, mm -hmm. you know, working for a brick and mortar company. Do you mind kind right. of telling you, telling the audience, because a lot of people are in the same position. They've not even done anything. They're thinking about doing the business and they're looking at a state farm or you know, one of these brand right. name type of institutions. Can you kind of give them some advice on kind of what that was like, like what they would expect and who you think would be a good fit for it? Yeah. So um, I actually uh, had a couple of opportunities to work for different seasoned uh, agents in the PNC uh, business, and I found a really good agent with State Farm that was offering me a solid base salary of around like 35000 plus commission. And, uh, you know, my dad uh, actually does final expense as well in Medicare, and he kind of pushed me to find something with a base salary just in case because he'd seen a lot of people fail out of final expense. And so uh, I decided to make a smoother transition and go the State Farm route and have that base salary. And uh, I liked it uh, for a while. And like I said, once COVID hit, it just changed things up. But as far as recommendations, if you're looking to go PNC, um, you're gonna, you're kind of limiting yourself to be honest because uh, your commissions are uh, really low, but um, it's really gonna be based on who your agent is. If you have a really good uh, agent that you're working for, you've got, uh, you can, you can have a really nice position, you know, and I was making, you know, decent money. Um, but if you go to like a brand new agent in PNC, you're going to really probably struggle. So I, I would advise it, uh, you know, just try it. Maybe you'll like it. I don't know. Um, it's not for everybody. It wasn't for me. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can imagine myself working for somebody else that would drive me mad. I'm, I'm curious. You keep you keep bringing up these interesting little tidbits, so I don't mean to keep going off tangent. We'll talk about final expense eventually, but I kind of you mentioned your dad sells final expense in Medicare, but he interestingly recommended you start working for someone else at the base salaries. Or any reason why you think he recommended that instead of like jumping in, duplicating yeah, exactly what he does? Just being protective. He was worried about me. I've got a family. Uh, you know, me and my wife have three kids. So he was just worried that it, you know, he knows that it's a high chance of you failing out of the business and he didn't want um, me to jump in and put my family in that situation. And so he was just being protective, just trying to get me some sales experience at State Farm. And then, you know, and then he, even whenever I told him, all right, dad, I'm ready to make the transition. He was like, just wait, wait till this COVID thing dies down you know, wait till next year. We'll, we'll get you started in January. And I just, I said, I can't, I can't do it. I'm going crazy. So, um, 
And uh, so I, I got, I just took the leap and I, I joined your agency and uh, I've been off and running since then. So, yeah. It's, it's really interesting. You know, I, I, you have children, I have children, you got three, I got four. And I think, you know, okay, maybe my son will one day sell insurance. And <laughs> would I tell him to do exactly the same route? And cause I started, you know, straight commission right in the final expense, but then, you know, going through the pains that we all do, it's, it's kind of an interesting thought. Would you recommend doing your, your kids do the same thing, you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I don't know. It's, it, it's a, a roller coaster of emotion sometimes. So, uh, you know, you get those chargebacks from time to time and it's like, oh God, it stings, you know? So, uh, I don't know. I think you have to have, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of toughness, you know, a lot of mental toughness for this. Yeah. Can you kind of speak on that? I mean, like I commonly tell my agents coming into this, that there's not really any competition per se. Sure. There's a lot of agents selling final expense, but you're not going to be like belly to belly in a war to get the client where I see right. the, the, the competition, if you will, is, is the agent himself and what goes on in his head. Can you kind of speak to that for the new person who's looking to get into this business? Like what are they going to be facing if they've never done a straight commission job before? Yeah. Um, it's really scary. Uh, my wife is a very cautious person. And uh, I was almost afraid to tell her how much I was spending on leads each week because it freaked her. It freaked. She gets freaked out about stuff like that, understandably. <laughs> and uh, she doesn't. She doesn't have the you know business mindset of this is an investment. I'm going to turn these leads into money. She just sees six hundred dollars a week on leads out the window, and she's like, Oh my God, that's twenty four hundred dollars a month. What are you doing with our money? Right. And so um, it takes. Uh, you have to have a lot of. Uh, a patient and uh, you got to have uh, some understanding of really the best thing for me was just uh, following guys like you that have veterans of the industry that have um, put out videos that are helping people and just follow their advice. And if you follow that advice and you stick to a system, uh, it's, it's way tougher to fail. Uh, if you just, you, you cannot um, try to do your own thing. And, you know, I see people on, uh, Facebook groups and stuff all the time saying, well, how do I get successful and make sales without buying leads? You can't, you can't do that in this day and age. I mean, you, you maybe can, uh, if you can, you're a better salesman than me. I recommend buy leads and uh, invest in your business. Yeah. It's like saying I'm fat. How can I lose weight and not eat what I want? You know? So it's right. like, yeah. there's a process and you're right. You bring up a really good point. You know, there's you have to have faith in the system, right? You know, and we're all human and it's funny. I mean, what you've experienced, I'm sure I've experienced and likewise, many agents who've done this business, this roller coaster of the good times and bad times and just dealing with yourself. It's, it's not a function. Are you going to avoid that? It's what system are you going to put into place to mitigate kind of the downtime so that you survive, you know, so much is about survival. Um, you mentioned something about leads. You know, this is commonly a thing for new agents, right? You know, they, many people are coming into insurance sales from a job, right? Their leads are provided if they're in insurance sales. They worked on a car lot, people came, right? And they sold them. Uh, but now, and, and if you're independent, at least, you're in a position where you have to invest in leads. Um, why is it important to invest in leads? Why not just cold call? What, what's your, you, you said you preferred leads. Can you kind of build on that for us? Well, so um, with State Farm, the leads were provided, um, and it was just purely a transactional thing, and um, I don't like that type of sales, but to, to answer your question, um, I start out whenever I, first, like my first two weeks, I was waiting on my uh, direct mail leads to come in, and I did some cold calling, and I worked some age leads, and it's tough. I mean, you are dealing with people that don't want anything to do with life insurance. They don't want those words mentioned to them. So um, it's really a grind and it, I could see getting burnt out very quickly doing that. Um, once my leads started flowing in, um, it was entirely different. You're working with people that are seeking out life insurance and um, they have a need and you're there to help them with that. So it's an entirely different experience. Uh, I, would, I would say if you're gonna go in and try to do cold calling, um, you know, just do that until your leads come in. Don't do that as a long-term plan. It's not going to work. You're going to get burnt out. 
And um, you're going to talk to a lot of people that are not going to want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, leads, leads are important. So yeah, and, and especially in final expenses, which is what you specialize in, and certainly what I have throughout my career as well. Leads are the crucible to your success. They're the foundation. Can you kind of tell the audience um, what kind of leads you've been using as a new agent? You know, a lot of new agents looking into final expense, they wonder what leads are the best, what leads work. Tell us kind of what's been working for you. So I, um, I've been doing direct mail is, is my go-to. Um, and I've tried a couple of different lead vendors for direct mail. Um, lead Concepts, they do a really good job. No complaints from them. Need a lead is another one that I like a lot. Um, those are really the highest quality leads that you can get. Ask any veteran agent, they'll tell you that. Um, so direct mail, if you're a face-to-face guy, if, you're, um, if your direct mail leads aren't coming in in time, which I've had that issue, um, so what I do is I supplement with Facebook leads when that happens because they have a quick turnaround and I've been using uh, game time leads, a l- little bit of TTC, but mostly the game time preferred leads. And those are really high quality leads. Um, you just, they go cold quicker. So you have to get on it. But uh, I really like the direct mail uh, leads that say the words life insurance on them. So, Again, for the new person, maybe somebody who's just done Facebook leads or maybe just done direct mail, hasn't done anything. What's the difference in working a a direct mail piece versus Facebook? You wouldn't think if you're new that direct mail would be anything. I mean, isn't everybody online? And actually it's it's, uh, direct mail is great. So kind of describe us the difference, the the difference between the Facebook and, and direct mail leads as far as quality, what you've experienced, et cetera. Right. And I'm probably just going to be repeating something that, uh, that you've said a million times, but, uh, the intent with direct mail, these people are physically writing on these. They are taking them to the mailbox and sending them out compared to Facebook leads. Um, you know, the good Facebook leads try to create more intent, um, and have multiple steps to them. So like the game time preferred, but they're still not getting as much, um, uh, the, the customers, the clients, potential clients aren't taking as many steps. So the intent isn't quite as high as a direct mail lead. The other thing is um, with direct mail, you've got their handwriting there. So you can go see those people several weeks after, after you got that lead in and they're still going to be responsive to it. Whereas that Facebook lead, it goes, it, like I said earlier, it goes cold so much quicker. I mean, you've only got a matter of days, to get in front of those people. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, and, and both lead sources work. You're the testament of it, um, you, whether you do direct mail or Facebook leads. Um, the nice thing is we do have options as agents, depending on your price point as far as leads go. The key thing is, of course, get a fresh and exclusive leads, which right. are brand new. They just came in. You get to them quickly, and you know that they're not going to be resold. A lot of organizations resell their leads. Um, what has the final expense business been like for you as, as far as the clientele goes? Kind of describe what you've been running into as far as like a, if there is a typical final expense prospect for those who may be unfamiliar with how this market is. Yeah, so my first couple of weeks um, or my first month probably, I was um, not, um, I wasn't really aware of what, what would work. So I, I live in a city that um, has, um, 75,000 people in it. And then right next to that is another 75,000. It's like a cluster of cities right on top of each other. And I thought, this is perfect. I'm going to go drop some mailers uh, in these cities uh, through lease concepts. And I'm going to go see all these people. I'm going to have tons of clients. And I tried that. And um, it's not as good as uh, the small towns where I'm driving uh, down dirt roads to go see these leads. Um, it, I much prefer whenever I'm uh, going to a lead that it is either down a dirt road or in a trailer park or something like that compared to these suburban uh, leads that I've worked before where um, the houses all look the same and uh, you can't, the people think they're smarter than the average bear to use a a old uh, idiom. But um, so, to me, my experience has been I prefer the rural country folk that are easygoing, 
their pace of life is much slower and uh, they're much easier to get in front of. Great. Perfect. So how do you get in front of them? What's your strategy? Do you set appointments? Do you door knock? Do you do both? <laughs> uh, I, I was telling somebody the other day what I do and uh, they were like, there's no way I could ever do that. But uh, basically I, yeah, I get the lead and I just show up and knock on their door and say, Hey, uh, remember sending this in? I'm the guy that talks to you about this stuff. Can I come in? And, um, you know, these, these country folk are really open to it because they're just like any, Oh, great. Somebody that's a uh, company. Yeah. Come on in. Let's have a cup of coffee. The uh, city folk. I mean, it's a different experience. You have to try a little bit uh, harder to get in the door with them. And um, they're, you know, they're all good people, but like I say, uh, I tend to do better with the, my kind of people are the, the laid back country folk, but right. yeah, I just show up. I don't do any appointments. I don't do any calls. Uh, I just show up and knock on their door. If they don't answer, I'll leave a sticky note, which um, it's their attention. And it says, sorry, we missed you. It's a little bit, um, I guess, in a way deceptive because it makes it look like they have a, a package delivery. And, um, you know, they will call you a dozen times in one night about that package. Yeah, they will. But you'll know when they're going to be home next time. And the next time you're in that area, you go and knock the door around that time and you got a shot at getting in front of them. And I always tell them that was me that left that sticky note. I'm sorry about that. So, yeah, right. Um, and and, and they'll talk to you about it, even though they're like, where's yeah. my package? And they're like, Oh yeah. Right. I mean, it works really well. Yeah. They're, they, they, I haven't had anybody get uh, really angry to my face. I've had angry voicemails like because I don't answer my phone when they call me about the package because I've tried that. It doesn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's easier just to show up again and say oh yeah that was me by the way uh if you have a couple minutes we'll go over this uh real quick so so yeah i've always wondered this so I, I live in tennessee i've worked in tennessee georgia and alabama full-time as a final expense agent do you find when you're door knocking like half the time you're going through your script and they've got the door open they're just kind of waiting for you to shut up and let you come in <laughs> yeah um i love when that happens <laughs> yeah i mean like <laughs> I always felt like it was way easier, like, like you, like they're a little more, more welcoming. They don't get strangers as much. And, you know, as long as you're coming off on the right foot, you know, they're generally welcoming, yeah. you know, science. Right. Yeah. Something that I kind of realized, uh, you know, uh, I rode with my dad one day and I, I kind of watched how he did it and um, it kind of clicked for me. Uh, he builds rapport before he ever talks about why there. He just, it's a quick, you know, joke or something just to kind of drop their guard a little bit. And then um, it makes it 10 times easier to get in the door. Because when you pull up, they're going, okay, who are you and what do you want? And you just say something like, oh, I love your, I love your garden. Uh, you must have a green thumb. This is, this looks amazing. And uh, oh yeah, and they'll start talking about their garden. Oh, by the way, the reason I'm here. And um, that has made things way uh, easier to get in the door. Just doing that little bit of rapport before you go into why you're there. Guys, that's, and that's a wonderful thing to, to, to incorporate. If there's anything you take from this, that's what makes door knocking really effective is if you come in there and you're cold and you're not, you know, loose and relaxed to a certain extent, you're going to kind of give off a vibe that, you know, you're nervous and they're going to think, what's up with this dude? They may not think that it's because you're nervous. They'll just think that is he's, is he planning something about to break in or something? People kind of get all freaked out and they, it's just normal. But if you can come up there and like I said, you know, like Jordan said, joke, you know, laugh a little bit, be friendly. Like that totally sends the best vibes. And I, I think so much of door knocking is just how you present yourself more than what you say even. And uh, in order to get in. So what's all this been like door knocking and presenting with all of this COVID pandemic going on? Can you kind of attest to that and kind of, kind of take us when you jumped in face to face? Cause yeah. you started right when all of this was going on, you've been doing face to face the whole time. So can you kind of just describe how it's been from start to where you are now? Um, yeah. Uh, I just kind of put my mask on before I ever go to the door. Um, I've tried it both ways with and without the mask. And I had, um, especially in the city, I had several people slam their door in my face uh, without the mask on. And, um, you know, 
it just were it it's better to have the mask on when you show up at the door i feel like and then once you're inside um what i do is uh, i let them decide if they want me to keep the mask on or not you know and uh if it doesn't come up i just keep the mask on if they tell me i can take it off i take it off um but yeah uh, it's it's presented it's presented actually uh an easy excuse for some of the clients to just be like, you know, I don't let anybody in with this whole COVID thing. I don't care if you're wearing a hazmat suit, you can't come in. And so you have to get creative sometimes. And I've uh, talked to people through the screen door for presentations and I'll say, okay, well, no problem. I'm going to go to my car real quick and I'm going to give you a call. Is this the right number? And I've done presentations that way. And um, I've sold policies doing that. So um, it does create that, built in easy excuse for people, but you have to treat it just like any other objection. You find a way to overcome it. Yeah. yeah and that's a perfect example of thinking on your feet, right? Because one thing I've, I've said uh, since all of this has started is that the pandemic has basically encouraged interest in what we do. When people are shown death and, and you know, the specter of death around the corner, they start thinking about things like what we have to sell. However, the pandemic is a legitimate uh, objection for some people. That doesn't still mean they're not interested. You just got to be like what Jordan's saying is creative and think of ways to, to overcome that. And you provide a perfect example and it works very well. Um, as, as a side note to that, Jordan, are you, just out of your personal opinion, is your experience with dealing with the perception of the severity of this, do you feel like people are, if, 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 and again, I'm thinking of somebody who's brand new thinking, well, geez, face-to-face sounds scary um, with this pandemic or people letting it, or, or people letting you in. Just how serious is it to the people that we're talking to? Are you finding this is a big issue? Is this a big p- point of resistance? Again, it's November, 2020, right? right? Um, what's your experience with that, Ben? And, and what's the real experience dealing with this potential objection? Yeah, um, in the city more so, uh, in the country less so. So whenever I'm out uh, knocking doors in the sticks, um, it if anything they they think it's you know overblown or or whatever. Uh, whereas in the city, you have to be a bit more cautious with it. Um, people tend to take it more seriously in the city. But um, overall, I mean, it hasn't been an issue for me um, other than the occasional person using it as an excuse to not let you in. Uh, overall, it's been really easy to, to get in people's homes and, uh, you know, they'll say something like, let me go grab my mask real quick and then they'll let you in. But um, most of the time I get in the home, they don't put a mask on. I wear my mask uh, the whole time unless they tell me to take it off and then I'll take it off. But overall, it's been uh, not a big deal. Uh, with the people that I've been dealing with. Keep in mind, I'm in Arkansas, so um, some other states I think are taking it uh, more seriously than others or or being more cautious than other states or whatever, but Arkansas is a southern state that most people here don't um, treat it as, um, you know, as big of a deal as other states, as maybe some other states. Yeah, and it's it's definitely a regional thing. Some places are going to be more, um, you know, have an issue with it more than others. I, I would say this, though, you know, generally speaking across the country, what you've described, Jordan, is is the case with most agents. They, they, they're the ones who are working hard, who are out there seeing the people that aren't using COVID as a reason not to do business are making sales. Uh, I've got a guy in Vegas that does extremely well, Las Vegas. He also at times will work places like he was in Arkansas the other week, down in Mississippi, South Carolina, and and he's making sales in all of these places. And demographically, Vegas is a lot different from middle of nowhere, you know, Southeast. So, you know, don't use this COVID as an excuse not to do business. You've described perfectly acceptable ways of doing business that, will still be socially distant and respect the other person's health. And again, as I said many times, perspective, perception is reality. 
Um, but when you get into what reality really is and you actually see people, you'll be shocked. I mean, I've, I've been shocked hearing how many people just flagrantly, when I say the prospects, and we're talking to people 16 older here, don't really care as much as it's made out to be. Right. So um, kind of tell us what, again, for the idea here, the, a lot of people watching this are newer to final expense. What's, what's been, what's like a typical presentation? Kind of take us through what you, what you do when you get in the door to hopefully convince a prospect to buy from you today. Right. So um, the first thing I try to do when I get in the door is uh, kind of take control and tell them, all right, let's go sit in the kitchen or um, I grab a chair and pull it up to, to the couch. I ask them to turn off the TV or mute it. Um, my goal is to get control of that situation um, and not let them control the presentation. So, uh, and then immediately once I've gotten uh, their attention and I can tell that they've turned off all the distractions and stuff, I'll go into um, a little bit of rapport, just a couple of minutes of, are you from around here? How are you holding up with COVID? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Do you have kids around here? Tell me about your kids. Just like not even five minutes. And then I'll go into, um, into my script of, so tell you who I am and what I do. And then I'll ask them about the postcard and why they, why they send it in. And then uh, what happens after you start talking to them as far as what their motives were, what happens after that? Yeah. Um, basically once I've, um, what I, what I like about your script and I follow your script is um, when I'm doing the self intro, I, you know, I specialize in helping people find affordable, high quality burial insurance. I like that because now they know we're talking about something they have to buy. Um, and then I ask them about their thoughts and concerns when they send the card in. And I always try to um, evoke that need a little bit. And, you know, a lot of these people don't have any burial insurance. So I think I mentioned this the other day in the group chat, but, or uh, on one of the meetings, but what I like to say is, okay, so you're saying you don't have any burial coverage, right? So how are you going to cover your, your, or how is your family going to cover your final expenses if you were to die today or tomorrow? How is that stuff paid for? And that has been really effective in just, uh, it's like uh, immediately they, they realize, oh, crap, I need, I need some life insurance. Crap, give me some life insurance. Um, so... So that's been really effective. And then from there, I do the pre-qualification. I basically follow your script, Dave, but the pre-qualification, uh, I do the, the billing with the bank account, the budget, um, and I start high. Just like you say, unless I can tell, um, if, if they mention something early on in the, uh, in the conversation about not wanting to pay more than 50 bucks or something like that, I'll kind of start with, well, the average customer pays about a hundred bucks. Um, are we too high? Do you need to see more options? And so I, I try to get a feel for the budget and then I move into the term and guarantee. I'm basically recapping your whole script, Dave. Sure, that's so fine. I move, into, <laughs> <laughs> I move into the term and guaranteed acceptance and then what I do. And then I tell them the company I'm going with and why I'm going with that company and show them the options. And uh, if I need to, I do a price drop close. How much pressure do you think you're applying throughout this whole script? Very little. The most, um, the most pressure that I'll apply is if I feel like they are trying to downplay the need for life insurance uh, in that, um, you know, whenever I'm asking them, why did you send this in? And they're trying to give me some non-answer. I'll use the, um, the three reasons uh, script and say, okay, well, typically when someone sends this in, it's, for one of three reasons, either they don't have any coverage and they want some, they, uh, they've got some coverage and they want to get a better price or they got, uh, they got plenty of coverage. They just want a little extra, which one of those are you? And, um, and then I'll try to just continue evoking that need, uh, and building that, uh, need there, because if you don't have that need, you're, there's really no point in moving forward. So, um, that's one of the biggest things that I've, learned is don't just plow ahead just take time and um ask them about um okay well 
you know, what do you want your life insurance to accomplish for you or for your family when you die? What do you want it to do? And ask them about their experiences with funerals. I mean, Dave, I'm just preaching all the things that you've taught. So you can tell that I, I just follow what you tell me to do and it works. So, yeah. Right. I mean, you know, the reason I'm having you say this is because, you know, I've only <laughs> said it a million times. <laughs> Sometimes hearing from somebody else, you know, confirming it actually does work. It, it actually works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dave actually knows this stuff, guys. He knows what he's talking about. You should listen to him. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Checks in the mail, my friend. So, uh, anyways, uh, wrapping this up, uh, question just came into my mind. What What are your goals for next year? What do you want to accomplish with the new year coming up in 2021? Um, so goals for next year, um, I'm hoping that my kids' school opens back up. Uh, we just shut down for COVID. So I'm hoping that opens back up and that I can um, uh, not have that whole situation going on. But um, th- basically, I've doubled the babysitters. I'm just like, hey, come on, uh, tell your friends. We need plenty of babysitters because I cannot <laughs> – I don't want to do telesales unless I absolutely have to. So. Um, I'm fine with paying them $15 an hour if it means that I can make, you know, uh, 10 times that. But um, my goals for next year, I want to um, get to a point to where I'm uh, consistently doing 5,000 AP a week. Um, uh, and that's placed, uh, issued and paid. I'm not talking just, uh, I'm talking 5,000 AP issued and paid. Right. And I want to do that consistent. Um, and I want to, uh, at some point get an appointment setter and just ramp that number up and, uh, ramp up my leads. And, um, my goal by the end of next year, I want to be consistently doing, uh, closer to 10,000 AP issue page. Good, good. Excellent. And what's cool is you'll do it because all you're going to do is just more of what you're doing, you know, for those, those new agents out there, you know, final expense, once you get into a flow, like where Jordan's at, um, you realize, Hey man, I'm doing 15 appointments a week. What if I did 30? It's no different clients. It's no different leads. It's the same exact process. You just will do more activity, of course. And you may need to change up how you source the appointments. For example, maybe you're not going to door knock as much. Maybe you'll outsource with appointment setting. These are things that I teach all my agents to do that want to go to that crazy level of activity, <laughs> but it is something that is achievable. And we're talking rural Arkansas area, you know, and, right. uh, you know, that I've seen it happen time and again. And so what's cool about this business is there's kind of this arc of getting started, getting your, your, your uh, bearing straight. And then when you start seeing consistently like you have, it's, it just becomes a function of how many leads am I buying and how much appointments am I running? And the sky's right. the limit. Just- it's great. Track your numbers, guys. Try to make sure that you're getting plenty of sits in each week. Um, make sure that you're trying to get in, actually trying to get in the door. Don't let people off the hook um, so easily because they're all going to have excuses. And, um, yeah, just uh, buy leads. Stick to a system that works like Dave, and uh, you'll be fine. Perfect. Well, Jordan, thank you so much for being here, guys. If you are interested in looking at possibly joining my agency, my links are above and below. You're welcome to check out more how my agency works. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, interview I did with Jordan, one of my newer agents. And Jordan, special thank you for you for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. It was fun. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. See ya. (laughs) All right, see ya.